I'm Matt Hudgens. He's Dave Mulvaney, and this is Profitability MD. Dave, how you doing today, buddy? I am doing great, Matt. And you? Life is good. We got a little sunshine here in Atlanta. Uh, seems like we're coming out of our frost. So uh, very excited. I'm, I'm ready for spring. Good. We're, we're in spring here, too. So, <laughs> Florida, you always are. What are you talking about? Starting. Starting. <laughs> All right. The... Uh, I was talking to a prospect, I think this was yesterday or the day before, let's call it yesterday for, and uh, never heard of this before. And so let's talk through this, uh, talk this through. But we were talking and he said, uh, you know, usually people talk about, I want to make more money and have more cash flow and more profit and that type of stuff. And his response was, oh, my cash flow is fine. It's great. It's wonderful. I just don't have anything to show for it, which... I thought was pretty funny. So what's the first thing when I, if I told you, Hey Dave, my cash flow is fine, but I really don't have anything to show for it. Um, I'd probably smile and say, how can your cash flow be fine if you don't have anything to show for it? That tells me immediately that, well, it tells me your cash flow is not fine or you don't make enough profit per job or you just spend everything you make. It's, it's one of those three things. I mean, there's no, you can't say your cash flow is fine. I mean, um, Sears went bankrupt on about three point eight billion in cash flow, and they could say, "Well, my cash flow is fine. I just have <laughs> oh six billion a year in, in you know expenses." Well, then your cash flow is not fine. You your cash flow must exceed your expenses, or it's not fine. We could just agree on that. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So that's that's the start. So. Um, I would think that's where you'd want to say, okay, well, wait a minute. What do you mean? I mean, wait a minute. you'd have to ask, what do you mean? It's fine. I mean, you've got to uh, um, describe what you mean by your cash flow is fine because that I would think that means different things to different people. And, and that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, and we talked a little bit about that. I kind of took it down to the road of um, we've talked about this book before uh, profit first and it's, it's really, it's pay yourself first. And in the financial planning world, it's kind of pay yourself first. So we would tell people in the financial planning world to, hey, you know, you get your paycheck and you automatically deduct uh, amount of money for your savings, you know, put it in your 401k, put it in your savings account. And then you have another bucket of money that goes and does your automatic bills to pay your monthly payments. And then you have this discretionary account. And then you've, you know, so that's what we talk about in the financial world, which is, Pay yourself first, put the money into savings or your 401k or your little war chest. Um, there's a great book called Profit First. I forget who wrote it. But Mike McCallis. Mike McCallis. All right. So that's a great book and I love that. And I teach that to all my clients. But the, but the first concept he talks about, he goes into real big detail, but I just like to start that, you know, I'm a top line guy. So like the top three things that I like to talk about is, all right, well, you just take the first 10% of every money that comes in the door and you put that into a separate bank account. That is your profit. That is your profit first. You're taking 10% off the top, putting it into that separate bank account so you won't touch it. Because if you leave it in your bank account, you usually spend it, whether it's a business or it's my wife's bank account or it's my daughter's, right? It gets spent if you leave cash laying around, right? Yeah, and I take that a step further. I, I, I typically say when you move money, whatever that percentage is, 10%, 3%, 5%, I don't care. Right. The ideal is to get it as high as possible as time goes right. along. But- um, whatever amount of money you're moving, that goes in an account that you physically, you write a check to, to yourself, your company or whatever, and you take that to a bank and you make a deposit and that bank account is not linked electronically to any of your other accounts. And meaning the only way you can get money out of that account is you have to physically go to the bank to get it. That's, that's, because most people, if they can move it electronically, what are they going to do when the money gets tight? It's easy. Yeah, yeah. makes it easy. They're going to take so we, their account. So we talk about that. So if you move that number, whatever the number is, you're exactly right. It doesn't have to be 10%. Hell, you can start with 3% if that's what you need to start with. Whatever you, you need start to start somewhere. You got to start somewhere to start doing it. And the idea is you put that money over there for a quarter, for 90 days. And hopefully you don't need to touch it. And if you don't touch it, then you take half of it and you distribute it. Now you'd pay yourself for that and you might use it. I know you love to say pay off the debt. Um, and then you leave the, the other half or 
whatever percentage in there kind of as a working capital, a cash reserve. But this now, the new quarter, you put in that 10%. And so now we got the money. And then at the end of the next 90 days, we take half of it out, and distribute it. And then the next quarter. So each time that little uh, war chest gets bigger and bigger on the side, but you're also forcing yourself to distribute. In, in my world, I tell people to distribute half of it every, every 90 days. I, I know you have a different, t tell, me, tell us again what you like to do. What I do is I say um, you take, uh, basically you take half of it and 25% uh, of that goes to the owners. 25% okay. um, goes to debt elimination. There you go. So you're paying yourself a distribution, a, uh, um, a bonus, what have you but the other 25%. So you're still paying yourself half, but in the process, we want to eliminate debt. And then at the end of the year, that 50% you've been carrying, you do one more extra distance. So you're going to go to quarterly distribution at the end of the year, just like you would do what each quarter, the 25, 25 and leaving 50 there. And of the 50 that's left, you're going to do the same thing. You take an extra 25%, that gets an extra 25 and the little 50 that's left is a bigger 50, but that 50 sits there and rides through the following year. Call it retained earnings, call it what you will. Working but, capital. Yeah. Usually yeah. working capital is what I call it. So you right. carry that the next year. Right. That's my recommendation until the debt's gone. Then you get half. Then you get half. And that's great. But the point is you're paying yourself first. You're starting to pay yourself first and, and consciously run the business on the rest of it. And technically you're supposed to take about 15% of every money that comes in the door and that's for your taxes, right? So really you're supposed to be running your shop off of 75%, right? Of the cash that runs into the door. So that's a different story. But what you said earlier reminds me of, um, you must not be making enough profit per job or per product or per project, right? Yes. Which is really amazing to me. And it reminds me of an existing client I had. And we had this conversation uh, about a year and a half ago. Maybe it's been two years now. And it was exactly that. Engineering firm, um, they make bids on their projects. So you got electricians, they make bids on their projects, right? But then they never went back and double checked, you know, how accurate was that bid and what was our profit after the job is over. They just make the bid, make the projections and then run it off of that. And then whatever cash is left over at the end. Yay. Right. But they never go back and double check. Like, well, how accurate was I on that bidding process? Do I need, I, I didn't account for enough labor or we had more labor than expected or the material prices went up. So then I needed to make adjustments going forward when I do make a bid, my next bid. Basically they weren't going back and double checking. Is that the case in engineering? I mean, in electricians and stuff like that? I mean, that's, a, that's what I'm getting into. They're not making enough profit for their own jobs and they don't even know it because they're not double checking themselves. Well, there's, there's several things that come in, with it, whether it's electricians, whether it's any type of contractor. And when I say contractor, um, I, I mean, let's just say, let, call it a professional, somebody who trades their time for money. I mean, that's ultimately what we all kind of are. I mean, we're all contractors in a sense. We trade our time for money. Um, but eventually you go on where your money makes you money. But so you take a contractor and they bid jobs. And what ends up happening is a few things. Exactly what you just described. They get a job done. They get the final payment. And they never really look at, okay, why, you know, we expected a 33% margin on that job. Why did we only end up with 22? They don't, they don't even know they ended up with 22 because they don't, aren't watching the books that close. Right. But the other side of it is a lot of times on the back end, the, the, if they're working for a general contractor, the general contractor squeezes them on the back end, which meaning they, when it's time to make the final payment, Short they changes. offer it, hey, we're not going to be able to pay you because they, they make stuff up. They say, we're not going to get paid for 60 days, but if you really want to get paid now, if you'll take a discount, we'll, you know, we'll pay you now instead of you having to wait another 60 days. And, and the contractor is over a barrel because he's got to make his payroll. He's got to make, and, and then he, so he ends up taking that less money and they never consider that. Now keep working for that same contractor. And almost all the general contractors I know in the commercial world, they all make that back end squeeze. And any general contractor that I work with, um, I tell them that if you're going to make a back end squeeze, I don't like that in, from an integrity level. However, um, you need to offer a reason to do it. I don't tell them not to do it. I say, if you really are not going to get paid, it can be a, 
a, a place where you can make profit. There's nothing wrong with it, but the, the, the person quoting that job needs to plan ahead for that. So that should already be built in. Okay, Bob's going to screw me on the back end. So I got to have Bob's screw fee on the back end. <laughs> so what we're really talking about, by the way, in our five step profit formula, this is number five profits, right? So what we're saying is you need to double check your profits, right? And on one side, you're talking about you need to build in if there's a uh, prepayment penalty. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to call it screw the fee, but like a discount. We would call it in the banking world, we call that factoring, uh, yeah. where it's like, hey, if I take the cash today, I don't get as much, but if I wait, I'll get my full 100%. But if I take it tomorrow, I only get 90%, right? So, so you're the screw fee, <laughs> you got to take that into account. Um, builders do this all the time, by the way. And that's where builders, uh, that's why they're always building the next house in construction is because. They're kind of running out of money. They need the next job to feed the money from just finishing up the previous one. All so right. I'm glad you brought up builders. Yeah. So I just had a conversation with a builder because I talk to contractors all the time. Yeah. And he was saying um, basically how he was – same thing. I'm building the next house. He, he Actually, it wasn't the next house. He, this guy builds million-plus dollar houses. I'm building two houses ahead to pay for the finish the one. Yes. I'm like, yes. wow, that's dangerous. He goes, I, that's, they're all doing that, man. Says, they're all I, doing I was that. like, doesn't that make you nervous? He said, nervous. It only makes me nervous if I don't have two more on the other side. The next the side. Board. That's exactly right. And that but is as long as I get profitability, so, MD. So what I told him was, is um, I, I started asking. Him, I said, how how much do you make on the finishings in the house? He says, well, typically I send them here, I send them here, and I'm really not getting anything on the finishings and furnishings. I said, well, that's probably a problem. I said, you're not looking at every aspect of building? He goes, yeah, but I'm cost plus. I said, yeah, but let's just say, um, forget tile, and I mean, don't forget it, but let's just say you got ABC cabinet manufacturer over here, and you work with ABC cabinets. You say, look, I'm going to, I want some back end from you. I'm going to send you my business. I need back end. You go to HVAC, this HVAC contractor, you get three contractors on the line. You got three cabinet guys lined up. Um, and you got these different people. You talk about this too, Matt. You got these different people who are um, going to feed you um, back end commissions um, when they get paid. And that's a profit center. You should be making profit off everything that goes into that house. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes the, the, the customer wants to go pick out their own flooring in Brazil. Okay, I get that. You can't make anything on that. But um, you got the guy laying the stone, and he's going to pay you a piece of his action. That's, that's the deal. And, and that's, what, that's what contracting is all about. Many contractors don't make money on the materials because they think, oh, well, that's not right. And I'm like, well, What's not right is you've got to build two houses ahead to pay for the one you're building for me. That's not right. Well, it's funny to talk about this. So, so um, I've built 13 spec houses and I've done nine flips, like where you fix it and pop the top and renovate and that kind of stuff. So, and then I've got several contractors as, or builders as my clients. And it's part of this is it's knowing your numbers and keeping track. So like when I would build a spec house, I got my, I got a bookkeeper involved and we spec'd everything out in advance, including the tile and the fixtures and the furnishings all in advance. And you had to give me a reason why we would differ from what your quote was for the wallboard. You had to give me a reason for the difference between the hardwood floors because I gave you the measurements and all the square feet. Um, so they're not good at, no, and they're not good at knowing all their numbers in advance or keeping track of their numbers. And then just like we talked about with that engineer, they're not keeping track of, gosh, the hardwood floor, I thought that was gonna be 10,000 bucks. It was really 12,000 bucks. They didn't realize that, they didn't call them on it. They didn't keep track. And then the change orders are what really kill them. When these guys get the change orders, and, and usually you charge a fee on the change orders, or you should charge a fee on the change orders, because that's where things get lost again. But it's almost like your profitability changes based on your knowledge of your own numbers. Right. Like you were saying, do you know how much you're making per job? Because if you're not keeping track, then 
that's where the money's going. The money is, is that you thought the hardwoods were 10,000 and they were 12. You thought the painting of the outside was going to be 14 and it was really 16. And you didn't, you forgot to pass that on to the client, right? You, even if you're doing cost plus 10%, right? Or cost plus 15 or 20, whatever your numbers happen to be. Um, you've got to know your numbers and keep track of your numbers. What these guys do is they just, oh, whatever, it'll take care of itself. It'll all wash out in the end. And they're the same thing that that builder you're talking about. He's waiting on payments from the bank and from the uh, uh, owner mm -hmm. because there's a lag in there. So he's got to have some floating uh, working capital. He actually makes it worse by having three houses going at once because he actually needs more cash working capital to float that difference in the payment. What typically happens is, like I said, you did it all hardwoods throughout the whole house and you had to pay your sub, but then you don't get paid by the bank and your client for another two weeks, right? Yeah. Well, now multiply that by three. I got three houses going and I just did the hardwoods in all three houses and I'm waiting for 14 to 21 days for all those houses. So by doing three houses, he's actually making his cash flow worse. You know, and it's funny, one, I have a, a very good friend who's probably one of the most successful builders that I know personally and very wealthy man. Um, he cash rolls you talk about profit first, um, his, he has so much cash that he never gets in a cash crunch. He's never, but I can guarantee you if there's one thing he's good at counting the, counting the back end. And that is, numbers. I think, um, there's two things you must, you, I mean, the, the hard part is a lot of people aren't that detailed. And if you're not, my, my thing would be and a lot of clients are very detailed and a lot of clients are the exact opposite of this spectrum. But my thing is always, if you're not detailed, then you need to make sure that you have this excess profitability in every job you do. And they're like, well, yeah, but then I'm not competitive. Then you're not, you're not spending enough time and effort positioning yourself as an expert in the marketplace and attracting your ideal client if you're quoting, if everything is based on quoting, then you're not attracting your ideal client. If you're attracting your ideal client, whatever you're doing, if they believe you're their expert, everybody's always willing to pay more for an expert. And you're right. that um, is exactly right. And you name your price, and that is meaning it's the opposite. It's the opposite of price line, right? Price line is name your price if you're the consumer. When you when you're on the other end of it, you're you're saying no. I mean, I this is what I provide, and you know our cost per square foot. You know to build a custom home, and that price range is you know two hundred and twenty five dollars a square foot. That's just the the cost that we charge, and uh, that's minimum. If you have any upgrades above, you know they we're giving you eight dollars a square foot for flooring. We're giving you X dollar. I mean, whatever. I mean, but that's the point. Is you. you you have to establish yourself as an expert. That's yes. prop, That's how you become profitable. Yeah, and this reminds me of this is this is one of my uh, one of my uh, clients that I've had for a long time, and uh, great example of all everything we're talking about. Know your numbers, pay yourself first, take money out of each deal. And he was in real estate down in Florida and um, build neighborhoods, built neighborhoods, and he had a partner, and so. This is interesting in that the average successful real estate person has gone bankrupt three times. Okay, so even if you're successful, you probably failed three other times. Okay, even if you're successful. So I know those numbers and, and I know this and I'm talking to my, my client. And so part of that is this, I didn't know it was called profit first back then, but my deal was, Let's take 50% of the profit from every transaction. Real estate guys are notorious for, okay, we made some money on this project. I'm just going to roll it into the next project. Oh, we made some money on this project. I'm going to roll it into the next project. And they never get the money out. So then what happens is when the last one collapses, all their money is gone because they had all their money in that last one. That's how it works. It works every single time. Last recession, eight, nine, and 10. Um, it's going to happen this next one coming up. I mean, what was that movie, Let It Ride? Or there was a movie. Let It Ride. Let It Ride. Yeah. Um, Let it ride. So you're supposed to take at least 50% off of every transaction. So this is a great example. So he and his partner, they're 50, 50 partners. After every transaction, I got my client to take 50% off. We took it off. We put it in a, what I call a wealth accumulation account. 
50% off, 50% off. At the end of the crash, at the end of the crash, his client, sorry, his partner, 50-50 partner, literally has no money because when at the end in 08, 09, and 10, when the collapse happened, it all goes to heck, right? What does my client have? Multi-millions of dollars in that wealth accumulation account because he took money out every time, 50% along the way, let it accumulate over time over here. And he ends up with this very nice, very nice pile of cash compared to his partner who literally has nothing because he kept rolling the deal, rolling the deal until the last one collapsed. And that, that's an example I use actually all the time with my clients in the sense of your, your business, we talked about the four pillars before, your business funds your lifestyle, but you got to get enough profit out of your business to fund your real estate, buying property, buying your office building, buying some investment property. You got to use the, the, the money from the business to fund your retirement. You got to use the money to fund your fourth pillar, your, your wealth accumulation account. Mm -hmm. You got to use your business to fund all these things. And as you talked about before, because if the business goes under, you're toast. But you at least if you had the other stuff free. taken so care of. I take it a step further. You brought up taxes before, uh, Matt, and you said you should put 15% aside for taxes. Um, I typically, um, when I when I had, when I get to that point with a client, I, I say, look, um, if, if all your money is being paid out in distribution, I don't recommend you do that. What I recommend you do is put yourself on a salary and make sure that that salary is under what, like, you, you know, what you're, what you can live off, but what, you know, far less than, um, than your company could possibly pay you. So you got bonus money on the other side of it, but by paying yourself a salary, number one, you're, you got withholding and as long as you're, an LLC taxed as a subchapter S or a subchapter S, that withholding all the profit from your business filters down and usually what you've already paid in tax is already covered from your withholding. Unless you have this big profit at the end of the year, then write yourself a bonus check. That's what we talked about. You're gonna do that quarterly, but when you take those quarterly bonuses, tack on the withholding. Now, and some will say, well, yeah, I don't wanna pay the social security on it. Um, I get that. You don't always have to pay it on everything, but I can tell you for years, I mean, I made lots and lots of money, but my withholding, I'd get to the end of the year and my company would have, you know, high, high profitability. And I had paid in so much in tax that I didn't owe the government anything. But, you know, people are like, well, you didn't pay any taxes. I'm like, yeah, I paid in, you know, I paid them a hundred. paid it along the way. I paid them 160 grand along the way. But I didn't know, yeah, I don't know them now, but they get to keep all I paid to them. Right? So um, it's, it's just a, it's a good methodology because just like taking profit first and putting aside, this allows you to put your taxes aside without having to do it on a quarterly basis. Because if you're a subchapter S and you, you're paying yourself as, a, um, as an employee, then that withholding is coming out. You don't have to plan on quarterly taxes, um, much like a, a C corporation. You have to pay your taxes quarterly on the corporate side. I don't ever recommend somebody being a C corporation um, as long um, as, long as um, they don't own other companies inside of the same company because you can't do that in subchapter S or an LLC that's not taxed as an LLC. But I didn't think we were going to get into taxes today. But, <laughs> but ultimately, well, there are you know, ways to save on taxes would be important. Yeah, that's what, that's what entre being an entrepreneur is about. I believe that every entrepreneur should pay their taxes and not, what they owe, but not a penny more and use every tax, um, legal tax loophole possible to avoid paying too much tax. We'll say it that way. Right. right. And, that's, and that's actually a stat that, that I quote all the time. Uh, and I can't remember where I came from. Is something like 93%, 94% of all business owners are overpaying their taxes. 94% of business owners are overpaying their taxes. And I've heard people say, uh, well, better to overpay than underpay. And I'm like, well, you know what? You get, um, you, you pay you what you only owe. get 100% right of the uh, uh, taxes. You basically, the tax deductions, you get 100% of the ones you take. If they audit you and take some back, well, they're going to take some back. But um, if you don't take that deduction, you will not get that deduction. So you should take every single one you can, and you should be aggressive about it. 
as long as your CPA says that that's legal. You, I'm not right. telling you to do things illegal. I mean, that'd right. be stupid. I mean, who? And that goes, and that's, and that's actually a great point. We can talk this about another time is that most CPAs are uh, pencil pushers. They're more interested in filling out your tax return. They're not giving you proactive tax planning advice. And that's really one of the things that I really stress in my business because it's not what you make, it's what you keep, right? right. So, so if, if you made $100,000 and you're paying 40,000 in taxes, you're only, you're only taking home 60. But if I could show you how to make 100,000 and, and instead of 40,000 in tax, we're only paying 20,000 in tax, I added 20,000 to your bottom line. That's 20,000 more that you got to take home. So, so in my mind, we want proactive tax planning on the front end. We don't just want pencil pushers. We want to start thinking. And that goes back to, like you said, take, don't take anything you're not entitled to, but take everything that you are entitled to and take advantage of the tax law was basically written for small business owners, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. If it wasn't so long and complex, there would be nothing to take advantage of, right? It'd be, you make a hundred dollars and you pay $30 in tax and we're done, yeah. right? The, the tax law is actually written for us, written for small business owners to make investments and to train staff and to invest in research and, and, and invest in training, right? Uh, those are all tax deductions that most well, and we're paid for our risk. I mean, that is ultimately, you know, I mean, when you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're the one taking the risk. I mean, that's, I mean, that's why the tax incentives are there to say, Hey, because you took this risk and you have employees, that's a good thing. They're going to pay taxes too. So we want entrepreneurs to take a risk so that they can grow um, and take some of those profits and hire people. Cause this is my argument always with people who say tax the rich. I'm like, well, if you understand the rich, the rich don't typically take a cut in pay. They'll cut employees before they'll cut their pay. Um, they need to keep their pay the same. So, I um, mean, they'll, they'll incentivize other employees to work harder to make up for the ones they just cut so they don't have to take. So it, by, by taxing the rich, it, 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 takes away for, it takes away jobs. But I'm not saying rich shouldn't, I think everybody should pay the same tax above a certain level, but that, that's neither here or there. That's not the tax code. So the current tax code says these deductions are available for entrepreneurs, for real estate investors. You know my feeling on real estate, your feeling on real estate. You should be involved in real estate um, if you're an entrepreneur because that's where the biggest tax loopholes are, uh, bar yep. none, yep. Um, and the lowest tax bracket. But you know, back to this whole cash flow thing. I mean, that's ultimately what we're talking about. But when somebody says I have good cash flow, but I'm not keeping any of it, the real question is, do you have the discipline to change? Because it really boils down to um, when there's a lot of cash going through your hands, you need to take, you need to look at it and say, I, I got to discipline myself and I can't take it all now. Um, it's, you know, imagine walking through the desert and you got two bottles of water. Well, you can't drink it all now. You, I mean, you're, you've got to, you, you know, you got to press on. And if you only have two bottles of water and you have to go four miles through the desert, well, that's got, those bottles of water have to last you that four miles. So you can't drink it all now. It's the same with cash in your business. You can't, just because you made $100,000 profit on a job, well, you can't go and, you know, go spend $100,000 and think it's going to be okay. I mean, spending half, I think, would be reckless, in my opinion, especially if you have any debt. If you don't have any debt, maybe half, but leave half, you know, get, get that profitability account put aside um, so you have something to continue when, you know, because businesses go up and down. You got to ride through those exactly. valleys. You need cash to ride through the valleys, like your friend who. Um, it sounded like the Wall Street Journal story. You got the the two guys. They both went anyway. That's it's a it's a good letter. It's about it, two guys. One guy read the Wall Street Journal. The other guy didn't. Of course, the guy who read the Wall Street Journal was he was the successful guy. But that sounds like a copywriter. Yeah, <laughs> it's a copywriter story. It's a copywriter story. No, no, that's pretty good. No, that, that's a real story with my with my guy, but and I use that all the time because that's the importance of cash flow and the importance of accumulating money out of the out of, over time, and the importance of having your business fund the four pillars and use the business and siphon the money out over time, because it, you might not have a chance to sell it. It might go under before you get to sell it, or 
or something to that effect. All right, we need to wrap up. So we started this conversation while I had a prospect tell me my cash flow is fine, but I don't have anything to show for it. And we were saying the truth of that is, well, your cash flow isn't fine. And so there could be different reasons for that. You don't know the profitability of each jobs. You mentioned your builder guy who has to have two other houses to keep his cash flow. That's like almost the velocity of money, right? He's not taking any money off the table. He's just got a lot of money moving through his bank accounts, right? Yeah. Um, so we talked about profit first where you take money off the table. We talked about knowing your numbers and, and understanding what your profitability is. Go back and check yourself, double check yourself. Um, on past jobs to make sure you're quoting things appropriately. So you are making a profit because the most important thing of business is to make a profit. And we use that to pay ourselves and, and pay our, our employees and, and continue to grow the business. So, and, and to build wealth. I mean, that's ultimately why we're here, right? Build wealth. That's the that's end exactly goal. Why we're build here. wealth so that, you know, when a business is done, it doesn't have to be, it can be sold. Um, but a lot of, a lot of business owners at the end, they close the doors, um, because they don't need the money anymore because they used it as a tool to build wealth. It's either no longer fun or it's no longer making money, but they don't know anybody. So they just close the doors and they can, and they open another business. They open another one. Nothing wrong right. with that. All right, man. Where can we find you? Easiest place to find me is at davidmulvaney.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, if you search David Mulvaney, you'll find me. There's uh, quite a bit on LinkedIn about me. And uh, But davidmulvaney.com, I do a webinar on Thursday where I help business owners um, to acquire customers in one of the easiest ways. If you're in the B2B world, um, that one of the easiest ways right now, I think, is using LinkedIn to attract your perfect customer and I've got a program that really helps you create a direct response customer acquisition system starting with LinkedIn. It's not everything we use. So that's awesome. All right. And I'm, that. I am at uh, let's see 10 X yeah 10 X profit blueprint.com 10 X profit blueprint.com and LinkedIn as well. And I'm a huge LinkedIn fan and I teach my guys how to use LinkedIn to grow their business as well. All right, man. Until next time. We'll talk we'll to you later. You, man. On.